Hello, everybody. How are you today? Thank you for joining us today for this very important conversation about health equity. Uh, and we're joined today uh, by an amazing group of panelists. And I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, from all of us at Havas and across the Havas group of companies, uh, for what we think is going to be a really important and rich conversation that probably uh, 45 minutes doesn't even come close to, to scratching the surface. Um, I'm joined by a group of luminaries here uh, across uh, social advocacy, uh, the medical system, uh, influencers. On my left here is uh, David Kamathrani, who's the CMO of New York Presbyterian. Uh, we have Dr. Jamie Rutland, the founder of the Rutland Medical Group and a, and a noted pulmonologist uh, on the west coast of the United States, but also you may know Jamie from uh, social, which we're going to get into. Content has been a big part about how he's changing the conversation about uh, wellness and health. We have Derek Johnson, uh, who needs no introduction, the CEO of the NAACP. We have Andre Gray, my partner in Welltainment, and... Um, and the uh, chief creative officer of Annex 88, uh, a culture agency that is, and content agency that's part of the Havas family. And then we have Chelsea Miller, uh, co-founder uh, uh, of the Freedom March NYC and um, is, uh, a principal of CPM um, Global. So let's dive into this uh, today. We started this conversation about well-tainment last year. Since we were up here a year ago. There are two conversations that have been dominating the health and wellness conversation globally. And those two conversations are around obesity and the, the meteoric rise of GLP-1s. And then the second thing equally uh, driving the health and wellness conversation is the absolute emergency that we have across teen populations around the world in mental health. These two conversations have dominated the news with thousands of articles every day, and yet there is a group of people that have been left out of this conversation, and that's why we're here today to, th to talk about some of what we think can be the solutions to that. And just to sort of set the stage on sort of where we are in, in, in what health equity means, because I think Andre and I get this question a lot when we start this. What is health equity? It feels like a word that people know, but they can't quite put their finger on what it's about. And it ultimately is about something quite simple, which is life expectancy. And there is a group of people uh, who are overwhelmingly black and brown who are having life expectancy outcomes that are far different. And, oh look, everything's playing automatically. And if we go back to this, that all starts in, uh, in the place with the highest life expectancy, which is, uh, which is Japan. Oh my goodness, what is going on? And, um, and the, the place with the lowest life expectancy, which is Sierra Leone. There is a 30 year delta in that. These health deserts, however, exist everywhere. And if you go to Boston, Massachusetts, for example, and you go between Back Bay, Massachusetts and Roxbury, Massachusetts, there is a two mile difference between these places and there is a 23 year difference in life expectancy. A 23 year difference in life expectancy. And these health deserts exist in nearly every place around the globe. And so as we double click on what that means and we dive into the obesity crisis, if we look across the planet Obesity is, is hurting everybody. It is driving the core of the medical conversation and it has overtaken hunger as the number one risk factor in your life expectancy. In fact, across the world, if we project where we're headed, 51% of the world will be classified as obese in nine years. Everywhere around the world. Crazy. And you say that, sir, but then we look and we double click into black and brown populations. Today, as we sit here, four out of five black women 
are classified as obese. So 10 years from now, 51%, Andre was kind enough to do the math for me the other day, is 80% today of black women suffer from obesity. Yet they are four times less likely to get access to these life-changing GLP-1 drugs. So four out of five suffering, four times less likely to get access to these life-changing drugs. And then we, we move into the world of mental health, which is a crisis amongst our youth. It is the fourth leading cause of death amongst kids 15 to 29. Already, everywhere around the world, the fourth leading cause. But amongst black teens, it is the second le leading cause of death. And in fact, it has risen 45% since 2012. If we look into where it starts, even at the ages of 13, we're seeing double the suicide rate amongst black, uh, uh, black teens as white teens. So we see a massive gap in, in health equity leading to those just horrific deltas in life expectancy. And the question is, what might we do about that? And that's what our conversation is about today. Um, just to sort of start to think about what this means and the work that gets there, when we start with our teens, we look at the mental health specialists in the US and the lack of access they have to doctors. As we sit here today, you see the little dot down there, 4% of psychologists are black and 2% of psychiatrists. So a huge delta in the access that they have to people that understand them. Um, so le let's dive into what we're, we're thinking as part of the solution. And, and we think it's not advertising because 55% of the content that we consume today is not ad supported. We think it's entertainment and, and, and we think this is both a human opportunity and a human right, but we also think there is a business opportunity for that. And, and we look at this from, McKinsey did a study, they, there is $10 billion a year lost because of last, lack of representation in Hollywood. And, and we're gonna dive into some of those solutions. Derek and the NAACP have been a big part of looking um, in those, and we're gonna talk uh, about their partnership with CBS Studios. We're gonna talk about uh, uh, an opportunity that we have working with uh, U UTA and Willow Smith, and we're gonna talk about working with our partners at Spring Hill on, uh, on a way to create content and entertainment around uh, the wellness conversation. So let's sort of dive in, and Derek, I wanna start with you because you've spent your life studying what are the root causes of how we've gotten to rep the misrepresentation, um, the health equity gaps, and where the core thing started 50 years ago? Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the panel. Poverty is a public policy choice, particularly in the United States. We have chosen to place people in poverty and do nothing about it. So let's start there. Uh, in the NACP, we're advocacy group. We believe that advocacy around public policy is actually the key to move communities out of poverty. It is great to have a soup kitchen and people are hungry, but it's more important to figure out why we have soup kitchens and eliminate those kitchens. So as we sit here today, whether we're talking about global poverty and hunger and obesity, or domestic as, i.e., the United States, it is all a public policy choice, and we need to change the narrative and not create a scenario where those who are living in, in poverty or with obesity are the, to blame for their obesity or their poverty when it's actually a decision by companies or globally to create that condition. Secondly, individuals are also confronted with genetically modified food. And as a result of that, we don't know the long-term impact. I think we're looking at the long-term impact. You know, for many years, if you think about high fructose corn syrup, that's unnatural. 
but it's in every single thing that we have, that we eat, that's sweetened for the most part. And then finally, the epidemic of mental health crisis among our young people, we must find the answer to that, but that's also a public policy choice. I think the impact of the pandemic and individuals who were socially distancing has created something that we're gonna study for decades to come, particularly with our young people who were unable to build social skills among their peers. I have a 17-year-old, I can see it with her. And those of you who have grandchildren or children, you probably can see it with your children as well. Thank you. Um, Andre, I'm gonna ask you to take off your uh, advertising hat for a moment and put on your professor hat. You've also spent a lot of time studying this and, and you talk a, a lot about the, the mistrust of the system, what the root causes are for that and, and how that's a, a, a place that we also need to consider when we start at the macro view of where we're at. Yeah, I, I think uh, public policy, of course, uh, uh, bouncing off what you were saying, um, access, right, and representation. Um, but I think there are two root uh, gaps, right? Uh, mistreatment and miseducation, right? I think that with the acceleration of the internet and the access to information and social media, places like TikTok, you know, et cetera, where people have access to the information, like the, the, the understanding of you know, things like the Tuskegee experiments and the way that systemically black people have been mistreated and the issues, when you're a person who's invested in that and that's your part of the internet, you're really aware of it, which is further building your kind of distrust for the system. So you know the system's not working for you, so you don't want to engage with it, right? So even if you do end up having access, if you do have healthcare, because if you are impoverished, I mean, even myself, I'm a quite successful person. I spent the first, you know, probably seven years of my career, I didn't have healthcare because I just couldn't afford it. And I'm like, you know, cross your fingers, cross your toes, and hope that shit goes away and, and keep it moving. And I think to, to come back to your, to your question, Eric, it, when it comes to addressing these communities and these people, right, we talked about it with AFib, right? People are having irregular heartbeats, over-indexing on black men over 70. And, you know, we were all, you know, quite, quite positively so, we're all brainstorming amongst our colleagues, amongst the natural data set, which is not predominantly black, and saying, well, why don't we go talk to these 70-year-old uh, black men? I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> you're not gonna talk to anybody's uh, grandfather about their health. Not like that, not just out of nowhere, because we know that you have left us out of the conversation, and those conversations need intimacy and trust and community to get there. You need to have advocates, and so it's not as simple as just let's find the people that need it. Let's also rebuild those bridges that we know are burnt. Yeah, well said. Um, and I think a good bridge to take us, we could spend, the, I think, this whole panel talking about the historical uh, uh, roots of this. Uh, we fast forward to today, Devika, your, your organization is one of the largest providers of healthcare in the United States, one of the largest research institutions, and is on the front lines of this crisis, and is doing things like the Dalio Center to fundamentally change what the outcomes are. Can you, can you share some yeah, so, um, so the Dalio Center, um, as Eric mentioned, is an institution that is focused on health equity at New York Presbyterian. And we approach it kind of with four kind of key pieces of focus. One is on data and infrastructure and is collecting the data and the socioeconomic information in order to identify and diagnose sort of what the disparities are. It's interesting, you know, we see a very diverse um, population given the fact that we're based in New York and we serve all communities. And we ask a lot of information of our patients and we're asking for that data because it helps us to figure out where are the problems and where do we target our clinical efforts in order to make care more accessible. So data is sort of the first piece. The second piece is around clinical programs within the communities. And we focus it on clinical care. How do you make sure that there's access to clinical programs that really matter to this community? Sickle cell, kidney disease, even transplant access, right? These are communities that absolutely need access because there is disproportionate impact of those diseases within the community. But it's also addressing um, sort of the social determinants of health, which are income, transportation, education, and how do we play a role in funding in many times those communities and partnering with them. 
The third piece is on research um, and making sure that we are focusing our clinical um, physicians and others on advancing the research in areas that maybe when you look in aggregate at a population, you might not say, oh, that's the disease to focus on right now. But when you focus on particular communities, you realize that it is a big problem and you need to make sure that there's focus. And the fourth piece is around um, education and training. And the education and training is both within the communities about their health, but the other thing is also training within the medical community, because what you don't want to do is have a situation where um, it's just one generation that focuses on this and sort of it, it, it doesn't pass on. Yeah, I th it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think you bring up the medical community. It's a natural transition to, to bring Jamie into this conversation. Dr. Rutland, at the, you've taken a whole different approach. So in addition to your practice, you took to social media, um, and you have created a whole new way for people to access you, access knowledge, and, um, and you've created an incredible following that I think is changing uh, you know, millions of lives. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I mean, for me, again, going with everybody else, it's education and understanding. Um, what I noticed as a pulmonary critical care physician, which means that I'm taking care of patients who are dying, is when certain cultural groups came into the hospital, I had to fill in a lot of gaps. Mm -hmm. And because of all these gaps that I had to fill in, there's a certain type of language that I had to use to catch people up. It's not the same language that some of the colleagues that don't look like me are using to people that look like me. And so I had to create a way of talking to individuals so that they could understand what was going on. So that way, when I told them what I was doing, they already arrived at that conclusion. But that goes with education and understanding the environment. The environment has a significant impact. That's what you're talking about when you brought up zip code, right? So when you drive through Beverly Hills, diesel trucks aren't driving through Beverly Hills. There's not a McDonald's on every corner in Beverly Hills. But when you drive through Compton, there's all kinds of diesel trucks. That's air pollution. There's all kinds of fast food on every corner. That's the high fructose corn syrup. And so you have to understand the environment to understand how you can impact health and impact their care, right? And so it's actually the boots on the ground work that has to be done. And so when I think about this entire situation, my job is to educate and I use social media to educate, and so I have to find a way to communicate a certain disease state or communicate the way an environment impacts a certain group of people within seconds to minutes, right? And I've spent years trying to figure out how to do that. I go to the barber shop probably twice a week when I'm home. I do a lot of educating in the barber shop, and everybody knows when I'm coming, and everybody has a question about X, Y, Z, right? They'll record my answers because that's where my people yeah. are kicking it. That's where they're hanging out. And now they know that if I'm, if it's Saturday and it's 8 a.m., they know Jamie's in the barbershop. So that's when they ask all the questions. And during the pandemic, it was a very popular time to go to the barbershop, <laughs> right? So lots of conversations were had yeah. during that period of time. But it's about education and understanding. And I think a lot of times people are using language to educate that my culture isn't quite understanding and we're not gonna ask questions about it. We're just gonna like get it, let it go. But you have to be able to grab them at, at that, grab us at that point when people are going to care. And if you don't have the language right, they're not, nobody's gonna listen to you. And the, and the, and the format, right? Yeah. Like you, I think, I'm sure you're gonna say that, but it's the language and also the format of the language, yeah. right? There are a lot of things that we have that we care about, like, uh, you know, Star Wars or, you know, what happened in Game of Thrones, you know what I mean, yep. or whatever. And there's a lot of things we don't care about, like ads. So yeah. how, do we, how do we fix that? Yeah. And I think, Chelsea, I just, we're, we're going to start to jump into maybe what, look, what solutions look like in the format. But I think the other thing is, but like us uh, uh, Gen Xers and millennials up here who have mostly failed in this task of closing a health equity gap before, you know, I think there is another push for change amongst Gen Z particularly when we talk about uh, uh, both of these crises, to try to erase some of the stigmas that have existed in culture and to bring out change in new and unexpected ways. Can you talk about what you're seeing um, in your work? Yeah, so it's always interesting, I think, being in these spaces because I think that what I've seen within community is that a lot of 
folks are already creating the solutions. I think that they don't necessarily have the platforms and the resources to be able to scale them. And so when we're talking about Gen Z, we know that social media is one of the most critical tools that we use to get information out. And so thinking about the ways that social media has created a community for so many young people who have shown up in these spaces to talk about you know, depression, to talk about anxiety, to talk about the things that they're facing. When we're talking about black youth specifically, and that number when we look at the suicide rate is for young black people under the age of 13. So we're also right. talking about the fact that we are losing black children, we are losing black futures. And so I think there's something to be said about how we understand these issues, the narratives that we say about them, because I think one of the biggest things is also destigmatizing shame. And what we've seen generationally is that there has been a huge issue in the conversations that we have at home, but then similarly, the conversations that we have in the workplace, the conversations that we have with physicians around what does it look like to make sure that we are breaking through these barriers. And the last point that I will make is that I think that Gen Z is a disruptive generation. And I say that because oftentimes when we have conversations about mental health, when we have conversations about physical health, we can't talk about that without also talking about climate change. We can't talk about that without also talking about food deserts, environmental justice. We absolutely cannot talk about that without talking about systemic inequity within our schools and the way that so many young people are often incorrectly, right, classified as disruptive, as angry, when in reality they are going through trauma. And so what does that look like for us also to make sure that we are putting resources in place within our schools so that we have mental health experts and that's not being essentially substituted with over-policing, especially within New York City, what we're seeing. And so I think that there's a lot for us to say about how we connect the dots on these conversations. I think there's a lot to say about how we include more movement leaders and young people into these conversations. And so I think that these sorts of spaces really help us to exhume a lot of those stories. Right. Uh, and I think telling new stories, starting new... I feel like you want to say something, Dr. Rutland. Please, I don't want... <laughs> Being able to have those conversations is extremely important. And just sharing something personally, my mom's side of the family is prim and proper. My dad was not around when I was growing up. I was raised by a single mom. And I just, when, she was, when Stephanie was talking right now, I just remember you know, people having a, a certain uh, stressor in life. I remember the day my father, I went to go visit him in Los Angeles. I was in seventh grade. He was gone for the entire week, and I had no idea where he was, why. He came home that night and he told me that he was a drug addict and he did drugs and that's what he was doing. That next week of school, and I didn't tell my mom that he told me. My mom obviously knew, that's why they were divorced. But that next week of school was a horrible week of school and I remember it like yesterday and I had no outlet. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. I just had to keep it in. And, it, it, and you know, when you think of situations like that, and it sucks to say this, I'm sh I know it happens in other communities as well, but just being in that position and not being able to talk about it like creates a certain anxiety and stress that just builds every single day, even up to this point. But I also take advantage of the fact that my dad did a couple of things for me growing up when I was in some difficult situations. But it's just having that platform to talk about it, which I think that Gen Z is doing, is, is nice. So we're on the right track, but we're not all the way there. Yeah, well said. So let's talk about solutions. Andre and I were up here a year ago uh, talking about the power of wealthtainment and a ton of interest, but the reality is it takes somewhere between 18 and 36 months to build entertainment content and put it out in the world, and people are hungry to create content today. And so what we're bringing is three solutions for that we're gonna talk about uh, with things, um, about how we start a new conversation. The, these are opportunities that are available today to put content in the world in the next six to 12 months, and, and, and we think that's gonna help accelerate the change that we think wellcontainment can make. And let's start with the first one, Andre. Um, talk about recipe for change. Um, set up where our partnership with uh, with Spring Hill and then let's play a quick little video. Yeah, uh, you know, Spring Hill, uh, Mav Carter, LeBron James, uh, you know, great partners with people like uh, PNG over at Wine and Screen. Um, Recipe for Change is interesting, right? It's, it, again, 
coming coming back to those intimate spaces, right? A barbershop, uh, breaking bread. You know, it's a great place to have a conversation and to and to start something to create a platform. Uh, to your point, and uh, we want to kind of take a dovetail off of uh, the equity that's been built in Recipe for Change and create a bit of a uh, you know a cookout. You know what I'm saying? For those that know. Uh, we're going to figure out who's invited, but it's, it's a place for us to have a conversation with us about the solutions we need. All right. Let's play. I believe we have a one-minute clip, if we can play that. Y'all know Recipe for Change, where we break bread and break down walls, having intimate, uncomfortable, and real-ass conversations around a full-course meal. In our business, you know, they want all of us to have this really sad story yeah. on why we came yeah. up. I'm like, no, I actually came from a dope-ass family. Yeah. My dad was around. He fixed everybody's bikes in the neighborhood. Well, now we're taking the conversation to closing the health equity gap. If you look at me and you don't see your sister, right. or your right. daughter, right. or your mother, yeah, right. or your best, best friend, yeah, right. mm -hmm. then you don't get to touch me. Recipe for change, the cookout. Same energy, same timing. Part of that is examining toxic masculinity within our own culture. New topics, new tips. Speaking of controversy. <laughs> oh, did I mention this is a cooking show? All the recipes, the tips, the tricks, and the tea. Chef. Yes, sir. What we got coming to us first? What we have here is a seafood pot pie. It has a shrimp, crab, and also lobster in it. And then we finish it off with a wonderful puff pastry, which gives it that light, buttery flavor and that crispiness right over the top. How you feel, man? Wait, but who all gonna be there? Yeah, Good to see you, brother. Good yes, sir. One, two, three. Chefs, celebs, influencers, and real doctors. Breaking it down and breaking bread. Especially as black women, I feel like once you reach a certain age, how come you're not married? Like, how come you don't have kids? We have to learn how to stop feeding into that and to say, like, no. We are enough. Recipe for change, the cookout. All right, so recipe for change. Um, I guess I'll start with you, uh, uh, David. Like, you, since you joined uh, um, NYP, you've transformed the way they created content. It was a very traditional marketing organization before. You've now brought data into that story. You've brought content into the story. Do you think something like this could work? Um, absolutely. So one of the things that we found was, obviously, we have an organization of thousands of brilliant physicians, but how do you take all of their information and their knowledge and make it sort of snackable and approachable so that consumers realize that they're learning and they're learning about how to take care of themselves better without feeling like they're getting lectured and sort of rolling their eyes and it doesn't feel like someone in a white coat sort of just lecturing you? Um, and some of that has been how we've taken content and reshaped it in social. A big part of that is how do you partner with others to be where consumers are, right? So we do things with Food Network and we say, you know what, when you're positioning a recipe online, how do you reshape that a little bit and explain why that particular recipe might be good for somebody with diabetes or why a certain type of food to eat is good because it's good for cardiac health? Yeah. And just trying to wrap content with medical messages has been incredibly successful for us. Yeah. Great. So I, I do think this will be phenomenal. Excellent. I did not pay David Kutz. <laughs> uh, um, I guess I'll open this up to, uh, like, because I think you get to a really important point, and I'll open this up to everybody. I feel like we have stigmatized food in society, and there is an opportunity to change the conversation about obesity and wellness by making a healthier conversation about food part of that. Thoughts? When you look at obesity and if you look at the, we were talking about the medication, the GLP-1s and how people look like me have less access to those medicines, right? Everybody's calling it the skinny shot. When you take it, all the medicine essentially does is tells you not to eat. Yeah. And so when you are giving that medicine to anyone, it's about learning the habit of what you're eating, right? And now you, you now are getting educated on oh, these are the things that I was eating beforehand. I'm not eating these things. Yeah. I've lost weight. So it has to come, instead of just telling somebody what to do and saying, oh, just take this, right. it has to come with some education. 
Yeah. And I think that that's what something like that offers is you're taking the time to not only say what should be done, but you're also showing people why it should be done because you have the time to do it. And that can become an issue with snackable content at, time, at times, but if, there's always a way. It's as simple as adding one sentence. It just has to be effective. Yeah. Other thoughts? I would also say that I think that this is an opportunity for us to look at the way, again, that things connect. So two weeks ago, I actually spent time in North Carolina at a farm learning about sustainability and what it looks like for us to even be able to grow our own food, movements that are coming up that specifically focus on black farmers yeah. and the work that they are doing around agriculture. And so I think that as we think about something like the cookout, I would even ask us to push further mm -hmm. on what we see when we look at the screen. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's an opportunity for us to think about, again, how all of these things are threads that we're missing. Yeah. And I would also say that specifically naming things, there's power in that. And so I think being able to show, right, the influencers, I've recognized a lot of folks on the screen, as well as celebrities, and bringing them into conversations that oftentimes you may not see them at, yeah. and realizing that when you pull back the veil, we are all human, and I think that that's also really essential to a lot of the narratives and the stories that we're even seeing at CPM Global. We do a lot of work around media, social impact, and storytelling, especially for young people. And what we're seeing with this generation is that we want that authentic content. We want to be able to connect with influencers and celebrities and normal people in very real ways. And yeah. so I think that this is a part of this larger movement that I think is coming up, and I think we can continue to build and build on this. Yeah. I th think, uh, did you want to add something, Derek? Yeah. No, I, I'm glad you're, you're creating this because as opposed to lecture to people, you reframe the conversation around food, the quality of food, and the value food is to life. Yeah. Uh, what we are losing in the African-American tradition is the art of cooking, hmm. the art of gardening, and taking the food from our gardens to yeah. the stove and to the plate. Though much of what we're talking about when you talk about obesity and health, it is well documented. Blue zones. Why do people live so long? It's the quality of the food, it's the diet, and it's the exercise. Simple. Yeah. Now, how do we get that to the average person to understand it? You have to do it on platforms and mediums in which they are consuming information so they can say, oh, you know what, the way my grandmother cooked greens is actually the preferred way and I shouldn't get this packaged mm. greens because it's not healthy because all the preservative. Mm. And in the conversation with individuals who are the same age demographics, individuals that you may look to for entertainment, you actually yeah. hear in a different type of conversation. So the concept of edutainment is really important. It's important because it can influence a large number of people to reframe how they see themselves, mm. how they see their health, and the things they do to improve upon that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I want to build on, uh, on something you said there, but also something that Chelsea said, which is the, the value and responsibility for celebrities and, and large influencers to change this conversation. A and I want to jump to another possible solution to this in the mental health space. Um, Andre, talk about Havas's relationship with UTA, Willow Smith, the opportunity to start a new conversation about mental health. Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, I think if we're not, uh, if, 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 you know, if we're not solving these problems for the next generation, we're not doing our duty to, to kind of pay it forward in, in that way. And I think that, um, you know, we, we are, the world's largest uh, health and wellness network. We are most certainly not an entertainment company. Uh, we are an entertainment network, but not as Havas. And so I think partners like UTA that know how to navigate this space, because when you step into the entertainment world, it's like one show you might need to talk to the producer, the other show you might need to talk directly to, uh, you know, the, the writer of the show, Issa Rae, you know, another show you might need to do this. And so how do you navigate those waters and find partners that can do that? And, and in UTA, that, that, you know, the partnership between Havas and UTA represents that. I think, uh, you know, they brought us this, this opportunity with Willow Smith. I think we, we, you know, we all know who Willow is. I think as such an eloquent, uh, well-spoken person who can speak um, 
candidly about her situation and frame it up for people, I think that's super powerful. But she's a perfect person also to address the intergenerational nature of things, right? We're all inheriting not only the, the traumas that we have you know, from our childhoods, as, as, as Jamie was talking about, but also the generational traumas that have come before us and the generational traumas that are already in our bodies. And so as we're thinking about that in, in such a public family, I think that's a really interesting platform. And I think, you know, the overall, before we play the clip, overall, the, thematically what we're talking about is context, yep. right? If you give me something I don't want in a context that I don't want it, then I don't want it. But entertainment is a context that you want. Right? You're tuning in every day. And so if we go to those places and we make our characters more interesting with things that are relevant to us, because that's all health and wellness is, is relevant to us. We're just not putting it in the context that's making it relevant. And, and that's why we want to see a shift in, in the way advertising is showing up. Yeah. So let's have a look. Let's hear from Willow. I think one of the things that's so powerful about hearing her speak is the, the raw honesty of how she speaks about, about her um, challenges. A lot of time to sit and just think about a lot of my childhood a lot of my childhood traumas that that still seep in to my life today there's a huge trigger of feeling like i'm only valued when i'm entertaining or when i'm performing and i'm not valued as just me without without putting on a show and trying to do the things you know um, and that's a, that, that hurts because everyone wants to be loved, not for what they do, but for who they are. So Chelsea, let's start with you on this. Is I, I feel like the, the voice of Gen Z that you hear in Willow is, is unique. There is, a, there is an honesty about the way that she talks about her struggle, but I also think there is an invitation that might bring other people in to being way more open about their struggles. So as I was listening to her, I think one of the biggest things that stood out was transparency. And I think that that's really critical for how we think about these conversations and also how we push systems and I think humanizing what that looks like. I would also say as I'm looking at her story though, as an activist, I see it as a part of a larger movement. And I think that there are so many voices that Willow represents that she shouldn't represent, right? Because it shouldn't be placed on her shoulders, yeah. but she does, right? And being able to understand, and I think especially when we talk about media and entertainment, Willow's talking about it from the perspective as someone who was born in a celebrity family and who was also an entertainer. But there's also a lot of young people who because of social media have de facto become entertainers within their own ecosystems that yeah. they've created. And how difficult it is to disconnect between who you are in real life from how you show up online. And so I think that that's also what we're seeing a lot in the narratives that we're creating and the partnerships and the clients that we're seeing and the challenges that they're having of how do you engage with Gen Z in a way that feels very authentic, but also speaks to these nuances that we often miss if we only platform willows, right? Yeah. And so how do we think about this in kind of that circular community that we're building with Gen Z? Yeah. And and just just adding to that, like I think what's also super interesting about Willow is like, you know, if anyone watched like the Will Smith documentary that he did last summer, right? Like he talked about, you know, we all think of Will Smith as this fantastic entertainer. And he was like, well, I had to be an entertainer in my household because my dad was an alcoholic and he used to beat everybody up. So we would walk in the house and be like, you know, how's dad doing today? And if he wasn't doing well, I'd be entertaining. That led him to being, you know, this great entertainer. And now his daughter is, is unpacking that. So as much as it's an elite story and could be very far, it's also a story that's relatable to anybody because these are things that are people are dealing with every day and which comes back to the original kind of points we were making, which is like when you just want to go approach a black family where we need to have, you know, an outside and an inside, right? Because our inside of our household is not always how we exactly want it because of the poverty and the policy and the things that are holding us back. And so, you know, we got the Jordans and the fly fits and, you know, maybe the shoe surgeons making some shoes for us. But when we, you know, we want to we want to protect that. And so you're wanting to come into our household and how are we navigating that and we need to create whole worlds and that's what entertainment is it's a whole world for you to engage in a long long tail conversation yeah she she talks about connection a lot in that in those 14 minutes on that documentary and the last thing she said and i found this super interesting she said 
the universe is infinite. There must be extraterrestrial life out there. If you're listening, beam me up so I can feel your vibe. Mm. Now, for me, the translation was she wants to understand and listen to other people. And she wants to hear their stories and feel their stories. And she wants to connect. And she felt, and she said this, like social media and technology was leading to a lack of connection between people. Yeah. Which was really interesting as we're talking about, you know, edutainment or well-tainment. But it, it was just interesting hearing her talk about that throughout the whole thing. Because that's one thing that I see in this generation upcoming is they want to connect with people. Yeah. And, I, and we have to take advantage of that and, and do that a lot better than we're doing. And I just wanted to quickly add to the point that you just said, Jamie, that even though what we're seeing with Gen Z and especially with Gen Alpha that's coming, yes, we are the most digitally native generation, but if you look at the studies, we are also the loneliest generation, right? Which is yeah. interesting to think about because yeah. we are so hyper-connected, but I think we're reimagining what that connection looks like to yeah. begin with. Yeah, I think, look, the loneliness is a massive part of this, right? They say one in seven men don't have a single friend, one in three don't have a best friend. Um, that just trickles down to all of the dangers that go with that. Um, the, the point, I, I was shocked by males under 30, many of them have never had sex. Yes. Because they're, they lack the social skills just yeah. to interact with people. They go yeah. deep with social media. That's, that's good and bad. The bad part is you don't know how to relate to anyone. Yeah. And it's causing long-term impacts that, you know, again, we're going to be studying this for decades to come. Yeah, and COVID was an accelerant to it, yeah. So I want to jump, uh, lastly, we're, we're sort of getting tight on time here. The NAACP and CBS Studios, we've started to, to talk about how we can partner on changing new conversations in health. Your partnership with CBS Studios that started a while ago was at its core about getting more authentic black and brown stories into Hollywood. Um, the pact is one of the things that we're working on together. Can you talk to folks about your partnership with CBS Studios about the pact? Sure, the NACP, we have always seen art as advocacy, how people see us on the screen is how we're treated in public policy and in the streets. And if you think about the concept of edutainment, I played basketball, I was horrible at it. In the early 80s, everyone wore Chuck Taylor All-Stars. I remember Chuck Taylors, right? Everyone's breaking their ankles. And then Run DMC came out with my Adidas. Then everybody wanted to wear Adidas. Yeah. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, it was this ball player out of Chicago who I would not name because I don't like him. I'm a Detroit Pistons fan. <laughs> Michael Jordan. <laughs> All of a sudden, everyone's wearing Nikes, right? Yeah. That's edutainment. Yeah. And it, it created Dr. J to run DMC to that person in Chicago. And it's just how it goes, right? The pack is a story of four young men who lived in a medically underserved community who happened to get admitted to medical school. And they had made a pact to go back to their community and serve their community. For us, we, we was able to negotiate a deal with CBS Studios to do a joint venture partnership. Why? Because of how people see us on screen is how we're treated. And as opposed to us always fighting against the images, we, we say, you know what, we need to get in the business of producing images. And so the pack is one of several things that we're working with you all on to, so people can see themselves that where you start is not where you have to end up. Yeah. And where you end up, you have a responsibility to go back to where you start to help others who are in that place. And so the, uh, the drama series that we hope to finally get platformed uh, in partnership is around those four individuals. A different world when it was at the top of his game in the 80s, increased enrollment at HBCUs the fivefold. And for some HBCUs, it was actually the difference between them closing their doors or not. And when you think about that impact over time, the goal here is to show that it is okay to do well in school. It's even more important to excel in school, and once you excel, you have a responsibility to help medically underserved communities. Those images become important. In any industry, when you say, well, we have a shortage of something, create a story narrative around it and project it, whether it's short form, long form, or a movie, so people can begin to see themselves as a part of the solutions. One of the things that I have tired of is being in discussions about all everybody there being the experts on the problem. Yeah. We know what the problems are. 
What are we going to do about it? Yeah. And so the concept of edutainment is about what are we going to do about it? How do we put people in a position of seeing themselves empowered enough to be a part of the solutions? Because for me, I didn't know what was possible growing up in Detroit. For many young people who have skills, they don't know what's possible. Yeah. But you project it on the screen, you put it in short form, or you put it in a TV series, they can begin to imagine what's possible. Yeah. yeah so I now I, I, we're getting the uh, signal from the back room to wrap things up. Uh, we're not surprised because I feel like we could talk about this for, for three more hours. Let's, I'd love to hear from each of you in 10 words or less, Andre, since you're, I'm going to let you speak first, I promise. Uh, um, is 10 words or less, we're back up here in three years. What do you hope is the conversation we're going to be having? I'm, I'm going to let someone else think about that. But what I wanted to say was just, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, re it's related, though. But I think this is Andre what, and I's relationship. Is, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's great. <laughs> uh, what well tame it is and why I think it is such an opportunity, and I think we should be beating clients off with sticks. Yeah. I think they're not getting the message yet. You have, you have advertising that people don't want. No one woke up this morning and said, I hope the target tweeted at me, man, what, what's happening? Yeah. But to take your point earlier, Chelsea, on platform, you have the platform of social media, which is great for reach, it's great for building community, it's great for having short stories over and over and over, but why would uh, the NAACP go partner with CBS? Why would a brand want to go get a part? Of These are yeah. the biggest platforms, yeah. right? When a movie comes, it does billions of dollars of revenue. So we're saying, let's take our stories, let's take your brand stories from where they are, some shit that's interrupting me when I got to go to the bathroom, right, in my TV show, and put it in the place that everyone's yeah. paying attention yeah. and take the stories, not only just Willow stories, but the stories of, of creators that are doing things every day and the stories of, of people that are making packs amongst each yeah. other to, to become doctors, the stories of real doctors like Jamie and put them on the largest platforms. That's yeah. what we're talking about. Love it. So in three years, we, we, we did it. We did it. Davica, will you take the bait on my question? Yeah, of ten I, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would say that, I, I, A, I hope that we've made a lot more progress talking about where there's been more destigmatizing of different conversations and also that more conversations have started. And I'm going to take more than 10 words for one second. Okay. Um, because one thing I wanted to share that I didn't get a chance to mention was, you know, sickle cell disease is a disease that affects um, the black community in this country in a very disproportionate way. And it is, a, it is a disease that requires more conversation and there needs to be more awareness of it. So one of the things that we've done, and this is the type of stuff that I hope that we talk about in three years, is like we're partnering with the NBA to actually design um, with Wilson and the NBA a basketball, an NBA basketball where one portion of it will be the color red. And the reason we're doing that is because when people see it across communities, across the nation and across the globe, we'll sort of ask the question, why is it red? Um, and that will begin a conversation about sickle cell. And so how are there gonna be more and more partnerships that just bring these important topics into the conversation? And I hope in three years, we're celebrating those. I, I love that, love you're doing it. And I just sort of say, I think it's so important because we don't trust our news sources. We don't trust our governments. We trust brands, we trust institutions, and I think it's so important for, for institutions like NYP to be doing things like that. I hope in three years we realize it's not that difficult. I hope you can watch a movie and realize that just putting one sentence in changes yeah. the impact of a single disease awareness campaign. Just one yeah. sentence. Oh, I gotta go get my inhaler for asthma, just real quick, or something like that in a movie. That's what I'm hoping, because I don't think this is that hard to insert totally this agree. into content. Totally agree. In the next three years, I hope that we understand the way that our history informs how we show up today and can, can translate that to future, I think, visions and dreams and thinking beyond what exists now. I always say that I think it's our responsibility, especially in media, to not see the world as it is, but as it should be. And so I think putting more diverse voices in rooms to do that, but also making sure that we're putting our capital where our mouth is. Yeah. We implement we study the data, we measure impact, and we implement again. Love it. Uh, thank you all. This was a great conversation, um, uh, and 
as we, we said when we first chatted last week, we could talk about this for hours. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, please reach out for, with any questions that you have about Welltainment, about these possibilities. Uh, like we said, like every one of us uh, uh, here, we hope we put more content, more Welltainment like this in the world to help change, uh, change those statistics. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Absolutely.